Peter, I'd like to start with a little anecdote from uh, maybe 16 years ago. Um, I was brought into a shop and introduced to Brooke Alderson as uh, Mrs. Peter Sheldahl. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, your husband is my favorite art critic. She said, what are you doing Thursday night? Because he loves meeting people who say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we did go to have dinner in your home on Thursday night, and that was a long time ago, and I've been waiting for this for a long time, so I don't want to blow it. Um, originally, we were going to start talking about art, but that's a black hole for both of us, so I thought writing is really what I find so <laughs> extraordinary about, uh, about you, and I, w I wanted to start with this quote. I got a couple of other quotes just to show the breadth and versatility. Here's one uh, that you recently wrote on Sur Baran. It's the last, it's just the last section in, in, the, uh, in the review. The Counter-Reformation didn't fancy tolerance. As a boy of 10, the artist would have been aware of the mass expulsion from Spain in 1609 of the descendants of Moors, like that of the Jews before them. Actions self-destructive for the nation's cultural <laughs> fertility. But Surbaran's humanized righteousness, like Velasquez's crystalline acumen, catches a fleeting glint of civil grace in history's dusky promenade. That's not only beautiful writing, it's really dense with implications for the present, for all those artists. How do you do stuff like that? How, how do you summarize uh, centuries of of wonder and, you know, uh, gave, and horror. If I gave that away, I'd, you know, I'd have a competition. And tell them. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, I've been writing, I'm 75 years old, I've been writing for probably close to 70 of those years. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get better at it. It's, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, I was a word drunk kid, and, and I became a, uh, poet. I was a, and I, was, I, I sort of date the, my career as a poet to the early 90s when I just stopped. I, I didn't know what a poem was anymore. I had, uh, I had been determinedly avant-garde and, and kind of just outran whatever supply line there was for, for poetry. Um, and also the, the art world parties were so much better than the poetry world parties. <laughs> um, uh, True. And the poet, poets are just horrible to each other. It's, uh, um, anyway, it was, and I, you know, I never studied art. I dropped out of college. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, a mixture of proud, defiant, and defensive about this, about my history. But it was the 60s, and... Um, uh, it was time to just throw yourself off cliffs, which I did, from, uh, from Minnesota to Iowa to New Jersey to New York uh, as a newspaper reporter. Uh, I think that my... Uh, uh, I, I think, actually, I, I like to say that my, my best teachers were writing for small city daily newspapers, were the uh, copy editors who were these sort of burned-out fat, you know, drunks uh, with cigars sitting around the copy, the copy desk and you'd give them your, your copy and they'd have like number one pencils, like crayons, you know, and throw it back at you. And then uh, until they'd hand it to the copy boy and in those days down to the linotype machine. And uh, um, it was, uh, that was, that was a discipline. You know, I had the the sort of passion and the romanticism and a, and a, and a certain musical sense of language and uh, they gave me some spine. And uh, I think, I think in, in a way it's just from, from really hard you know, journalism and poetry. I mean, it was, it was an accident. It was like, and I was in New York and um, uh, freelancing, starving poet, Lower East Side. And in the 60s, all the poets wrote art criticism. They all wrote for Art News. Art News in those days reviewed every show in town. Uh, one sentence reviews. Uh, and, uh, and I would write 30 of those a, a month for like $3 a piece and, you know, and support myself. Uh, that's $9, Peter. Uh, that's 30, oh, 30 times, yeah, 90, $90, oh. $90. I mean, my, my, my rent was $40 and, uh, and four burglaries a, a year. But... but uh, <laughs> But all you ever had was a record player and a typewriter, and if you, 
if you ran down to the street, you might be able to buy it back. You know, I, um, well, poets used to support themselves by writing art criticism, and yeah. now it's kind of the other way around, because uh, with so few art critics uh, well, it was, employable you know, by newspapers and it who've was, gotten... Uh, you know, I was in love with art. I had uh, I'd spent a year of starving poet year in Paris, uh, where, by the way, I went sort of thinking I spoke French, and the French explained to me that I did not speak French. <laughs> so, uh, so I took the advice and stopped trying. But, um, but that's because I was from Minnesota, and it was the early 60s, and uh, we had the idea that Paris was where it was at. You know, our information was 25 years out of date, mm. you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, it was... Uh, I'd already been in New York, and then uh, I remember going to an Andy Warhol show in, in Paris and going, wrong city, you know. Get, get back. <laughs> but meanwhile, I had, you know, fallen in love with, with painting. Anyway, it was, um, it was all, you know, a series of ultimately fortunate accidents. Tell me about falling in love with paintings. Did huh? that happen? Tell me about falling in love with paintings. Did that happen in Minnesota? No, no. I, I, had, uh, I had seen very little art. My parents... We were very in, not very interested in art at all. They were not interested in art at all. And uh, uh, I don't know. This, I think, all right, I'm, I'm subject, I've been subject to epiphanies. I think most of us are at different times in our lives. Uh, mine, the one I, 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 my mind keeps going back to was... Uh, I had a friend, it was the brother of a friend from Minneapolis who was a painter named George Schneeman who lived in Italy at the time in a rural place, very poor, but he had a family and he was a total enthusiast. And he took me around on the back of his Vespa that's outside Siena and went, you know, looked at, uh, at all the uh, Museo Chivicos in all the, all the towns and... Um, and he took me on the Piero della Francesca tour, Ooh. where you go from Rezzo, you know, down to San Sepulcro. And, uh, but midway, there is this little town of Monterchi, which uh, was where Piero was from. And in, at that time, it's, it's now, uh, they have a museum, but at that time, it was in a, still in a cemetery chapel, it was about the size of a tool shed. It's a, a fresco of the pregnant Madonna. Madonna del Parto, mm -hmm. and uh, there's this pensive, young, hugely pregnant Madonna in a bell-shaped tent with mirror in Im image angels in, uh, I think in green and purple, sweeping aside the leaves of the tent to, to reveal her. And it's like, I think of it as, it's like the, the tent echoes her belly, is it, and, and the lunette of the, of the fresco. It's like sort of a secret within a secret within a mm -hmm. secret. And George uh, told me a sentimental story, which I, I've never seen encountered anywhere. I think maybe he made it up, but it was uh, that, in fact, when uh, Piero was a big deal in Florence, uh, he had a girlfriend in Monterchi who died in childbirth giving birth to his child, he couldn't acknowledge her. And so he went there and as penance did this picture in this very strange place, you know. And I don't know, so it's a sentimental story, you know. So I burst into tears. And, uh, but also, I don't know, it was the August afternoon, it was hot, dusty, and uh, something happened. It's like I, I thought, whatever I do in my life is going to have something to do with that. And what that was is something I'm still trying to figure out. Mm. So, Wonderful. And then, and then Andy Warhol's flower paintings, you know, it was... Uh, Perfect segue. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another quote. Mm. Uh, for something, now for something totally different. It's on the, uh, the exhibition uh, Americans at the National Museum of the American Indian. But these are la this is last month, these two posts. Right, these, yeah, are, yeah. these are recent. Yeah. Uh, for the two or three people who haven't read, read me yet... <laughs> As an old white man, I can't propose my pleasure in Americans as a model response to it, given the plurality of brains that burn with variants of rage or anguish in this time of identity politics. But I'll dare to endorse an approach 
a specialty of Paul Chat Smith's that lets identity and politics float a little free of each other, allowing wisdom to seep in. And Paul Chat Smith was the co-curator of this exhibition that you wrote about. Yeah. Um, and who's Cher- uh, Cherokee, right? He's, yeah, he's, he's a head curator at the, at the um, Museum of the American Indian in, in Washington. But he's, you, you get Cherokee. You get your you you have your cake and you eat it too. And the, you've, there's no, a he's, sleight of hand he's in Comanche, this. Comanche, which, uh, Comanche, yeah. that's right. But Excuse you me. said there's a big difference. It, it, compared to the Comanches, other other Native Americans were Girl Scouts. Uh no, huh. No, no. And uh, is there something of that in his personality? Or? Uh, no, no, he's quite he's quite mellow, but he's. Uh, I don't know, he's a very funny writer. Paul Chat Smith, C-H-A-A-T. I highly recommend reading him. He has a book uh, of essays called uh, Everything You Know About Indians is Wrong. Now, he's uh, about your age, right? Uh, about 10 years younger. 10 years or, younger? Or more, 15 years. It, this is a remarkable little, little piece of writing in here uh-huh. that I find, of course, very, very timely. But yeah. you've, you've managed to say that you completely endorse um, uh, the writer and the curator of this show without actually, I think, offending anyone by any kind of position that well, you're taking. Well, we'll see, we'll see about that. Uh, I think, but you didn't get any hate mail from that, that uh, review? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I think people are lazy. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> they're lying. I don't, I don't go on social media, so for all I know, they're, you know they've got uh, torches and pitchforks going there. But, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they do, actually, a little bit too much. Here's one last one, just because I want to give some samplers here on, on Peter Hujar. To talk about the, versi- the versatility mm-hmm. of your writing again. His personal glamour consorts so awkwardly with his artistic discipline that trying to keep both in mind at once can hurt your brain. Mm-hmm. And that can apply to a number of other artists, and mm-hmm. it's something to say about those artists that I've never heard said before. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's important, and it's the separation okay. of... Of the artist and the person. I think, I think that I think that any any truly original artist, uh, you know, uses uh, uses neuronal you know connections that that uh, we don't use, we haven't used. I mean, they're they're thin and frail, and it hurts. You know, um, I'm trying to put a lot of juice through a thin wire. I don't know. Isn't that interesting? Science, um, but. Uh, <laughs> um, now, I've accused you of being a different writer at The New Yorker than you were at uh, The Village Voice. Because um, I read you in both um, instances. And all right, what do you think the difference is? Uh? I, um, reading you was an adventure in The Voice. Uh-huh. I had to have all my wits about me, and I had to pay attention. Uh-huh. Uh, that's not the case at The New Yorker. It's more of a performance that I'm enjoying uh-huh. Uh-huh. passively and don't Thank have you. to struggle with whatsoever. Uh-huh. Is that you, or is no. that the editor, well, or is it, that the it, difference in those two periodicals? It was a difference in the periodicals. I mean, in, uh, in The Village Voice, I was writing for a downtown audience. I could assume a tremendous amount. You know, I could, I could just jump into, into things that they would know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, the New Yorker, I think, what, 10 to 20 percent of the, the audience is in New York. You know, the rest is, is worldwide. So. So I, I can't assume anything, and I've got to, uh, you know, it, it's uh, every periodical has its has its audience, and you uh, you adjust. Also, the editing is is extremely rigorous. Um, you know, people say there's a New Yorker style. I don't think there is. There's a New Yorker standard. Oh. I mean, it's like uh, there are a lot of eyes on the copy, and a lot of suggestions, and um, you know, it's, uh, for which I'm grateful. I, I, I guess maybe I was happiest in my life at the, the Village Voice because it was, first of all, I was writing every week. In the New Yorker, they have more critics and they have pages for criticism. So uh, I'm not in every week. And, and I think in a big city, your sensibility recycles every seven days. I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like a power plant. If you, if you, let it go cold, you got to crank it up again, you know. Right. Uh, but, uh, and also having, having a hip audience. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to hear me complain about being at the New Yorker, you better hold your breath until you die. I mean, it's not going to happen. So. <laughs> oh, well, that wasn't the point of my question, okay. uh, definitely, because you won't hear me complain about the New Yorker either. But, so, so, 
Do you ever let your power plant get cold, or do you wake up in the morning and write every day whether there's a whether there's a deadline or a piece to submit? No, I need a deadline now. I don't. Uh, it's uh, external motivation. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's you know I'm uh, always thinking, I guess, but uh, writing is. Uh, uh, no, I, I think I am now a conditioned deadline machine, and without it, uh, I don't know what life is for. No. I mean, I think I think that I think that if I don't have a deadline and I can just flake off, it'll be great. But I'm absolutely miserable. Uh, you know, and uh, is it like nobody loves you? They're not giving you a deadline. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm I'm done. You know, it's uh, life's over. You know, I'm uh, I'm an embarrassment. Um, and uh, and then a deadline, which is agony, but. Uh, Take, takes maybe, you know, two or three days to write the first sentence, and then, um, you don't want to do this. It's, uh, you know, not really fun. But, but this, is, this is also commonplace. I mean, I think other writers will tell you the same thing. Why, speaking of other writers, are, is uh, the art world so notorious for its bad writing? I mean, some really, really spectacular well, bad writing. Well, because, because it's, it's interesting. The art world, the art world used to be tiny. Uh, you know, when, when I came in the 60s and started, there were a few galleries on Upper Madison Avenue and a few on 57th Street, and that was it. Mm. Okay. And um, a couple of museums and, um, and a couple of publications. It's, um, I have a feeling the art world that matters to me is still rather tiny. Uh, it's it, it, people who care. Who really care about art, you know, and uh, there are tremendous numbers of people and kinds of people who are involved with art now who I don't think particularly care, uh, and uh, I agree with that. and and you know, God bless them. I mean, it's everybody needs a job, um, but uh, and the system needs money, so come on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's become a, a money machine and a prestige machine. Um, that's the historical period that it's going through, and. Uh, but, but also, they, it, first of all, before the 60s, I don't think anybody in human history trained to be an art critic. You know, it was all accident. You know, it was all like people who wrote about other things, a lot of poets, poets particularly, mm -hmm. you know, Baudelaire being, right. being the, the, uh, the father or the inspired crazy uncle of us all, you know, and... Uh, Apollinaire, Frank O'Hara, John Ashbery, the poets were my heroes in, in, uh, in the 60s in New York. Um, Fine writers all. And, you know, Harold Rosenberg was a poet. It, uh, Clement Greenberg was, you know, a uh, vastly ambitious intellectual who, who basically started writing about art because at the Partisan Review was a magazine in the 30s, they needed an art critic, and he stepped in. You know, it was like all self-educated. Um, the, uh, but of course it became academicized mm -hmm. and um, I mean art history always had been and uh, you get people starting to, to write art criticism who've been writing academic papers and you don't, you know, it, it shouldn't be physically impossible to make the jump but it, it seems to be, mm -hmm. I mean it seems like no, nobody does it it's like uh, once you've got that that's sound in your head. You can't get rid of it. It's uh, uh, abstract nouns. Um, and, but, you know, it's, the difference is academic writing is, is written for people who have to read it. Okay? <laughs> they have to read it. And, and, and the writer knows that. And, and, and if the writer shows any kind of style or flair or humor, it's just going to be resented, okay? <laughs> you, know, you know, get the hell on with it, all right? Uh, you know, if people don't enjoy my writing, I starve, right? And nobody has to read me. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's strictly uh, optional. And, uh, but between, you know, poetry and journalism, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I'm... Uh, but I remember, you know, at a time when there was uh, journalism was the ultimate insult uh, for uh, criticism. But I'm decided I'm a journalist. You know, I write for journals.
It's a, a journalism of an, a whole other order, though, uh, Peter. Pardon? And it's, a, it's a journalism of a whole other order. But well, speaking I hope, of... I, I'm, you know, I'm, okay. I, I hope it's, it's also literature of some... It, it is. Okay. Officially. Although, it's like Oscar Wilde said, uh, said uh, journalism is unreadable and literature is unread. And that's all the only difference. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, you've proven him wrong. So, speaking of journalism, you used to write a lot about contemporary art at The Voice, mm -hmm. and now it's less frequent. You still write about contemporary art, and you, you write about it with the same uh, felicity and beauty that you do about old masters, but you write more about old masters. Is yeah. that you, or is that The New Yorker? Well, that's, that, that's uh, both. I mean, I think uh, writing less often, I'm kind of obliged to do the big shows. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't have... At The Voice, it would be like there'd be time for lots of little gallery shows along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and I do actually write some of the anonymous reviews in the front. Uh, uh, and um, the, the editor of the front of the magazine was a unsigned going on about town, you know, will give me a list of artists I've never heard of and send, send me out to Lower East Side Galleries, which is very good for me. They're uh, high because, those because, you know, I'm, you know, I stay home now, you know. I, I, and... Uh, uh, but also, the, the idea of contemporary art. What is contemporary art? To me, contemporary art is all the art there is that exists now, whether it was made five minutes ago or 5,000 years ago. It, it, it's like, you know, we are looking at it with contemporary eyes because there are no other kinds of eyes. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody else is dead, or they haven't been born yet, you know, and, uh, uh, and um, so I don't, I don't regard it as shifting gears, you know, um, it's, uh, and also, I mean, I think for, for play, for my own pleasure, I, I, I gravitate back to the Metropolitan and the Frick Collection, and, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the old guys. It, it, the idea that uh, uh, is, uh, is Shakespeare an old master, you know, that, that we don't care about anymore? You know, I mean, if you're interested in literature, Shakespeare is in play continuously. Every generation tests themselves against Shakespeare. And, and, um, uh, and, you know, and the people, when I say people who care about art, are people who do that. Mm -hmm. You know, who who, uh, educated or not, will in fact look at a Rembrandt until they get it, you know, and, um, and once you get it, it's, uh, um, you know, everything else is kind of has to line up because it uh, doesn't get any better. One of my favorite abstract painters is, a, well, he's, he's now dead, but Eugène Leroy from the northern France. Uh, he would paint the model over and over and over, and, yeah. and, and paint uh -huh. becomes guano. And he once said that... Uh, but he never really liked Poussin until he saw one upside down, and uh -huh. that's when he—that's when he understood uh -huh. that he was uh -huh. one of the great artists, and that he needed to <laughs> decline his own work uh, in the context of Poussin. Upside down. Well, we were talking about uh, El Greco upside down. That was, that was, that's that's a that's a revelation, by the way. See, you've got a really nice El Greco here. Did, uh, if you take a reproduction, turn it upside down. There's, there's this oddity about. El Greco that you think is about the elongation of, of the figures, mm -hmm. but it's really about a kind of reverse gravity. It's like, uh, which, you know, you don't quite realize because, you, you, because he does, most of his figures are in fact standing or sitting. But if you turn it upside down, you realize they start to fall. It's like, like, you know, lava lamp, you know, the blob. Oh, I up. see. You know, they start, they start to sort of fall. And, it's, and then you turn it back up and you realize that's the effect. They're Every, elongated Everything, everything is, is subject to a, an upside-down gravity. Beautiful. And, uh, which I think Picasso got, by the way. I think he, uh, you, uh, you've been living on, you're still living on St. Mark's Place, yeah. right? You've been there for 40-some-odd years? 40, 45. Um, St. Mark's Place between first and second. And just a little By the plug. way, I've got to do a shout out for my daughter, who's a great writer, who among her several books is a history of St. Mark's Place. Yes. Uh, from the 17th century. Uh, and uh, it's called St. Mark's is Dead. 
because everyone whose life was ever changed on St. Mark's Place or in that vicinity will tell you when the scene died and give you a different date. It's like when they stopped being cool. Okay? Right. You know, and, uh, That's when it and, died. And, but there has been waves, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's from Norton. Uh, it's, you know, it's out in paperback now. Uh, and her name is Ada Calhoun. Ada Calhoun. But, and uh, but I heard her... Uh, uh, one of her talks uh, she gave uh, that people were complaining about the rising rents. And she said, well, first of all, that's making a mistake that every generation makes in the world, probably, but definitely in, in lower Manhattan, that the way things are now are the way they're going to stay. Mm. Nothing stays, okay? And also, if you complain about being forced out of the neighborhood and you're not a Lenape Indian, I have no compassion. Interesting. They were, it was their hunting ground when Peter Stuyvesant came in and ran them out to, to have a farm. Now, they had a real grievance. Huh? They had a real grievance. Maybe, yeah. maybe the cool kids who have to move to Brooklyn don't. Uh, the reason I brought up St. Mark's Place was because, you know, New York is still arguably the best place to see art. Mm -hmm. But the New York art scene, and I'm going to be very brave here and say... It's seen better days, and it's been in a kind of a long slump now. I'm looking at art everywhere in the world, and I'm not looking at art that emerges out of New York yeah, all that much. Yeah. Am I right? And if so, why no, is that? No, it's true. I think, I think there are a lot of scenes. You know, it's, I mean, what we've seen in the, in, in the last you know, 20, 30 years is, is the fragmentation of, of a scene. There, there is no the scene. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, uh, and it seems remarkable, looking back, that we even believed there was. I mean, it was like... Uh, it was a kind of myth that took form in the uh, 19th century around the Parisian avant-garde and, you know, and was <clears throat> maintained, uh, you know, until, until really the 50s, 60s. 60s is where everything hit the wall. Um, and uh, uh, it's... Uh, hello. Um, tell him I'm not here. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, well, also, the, the, I mean, the rents are, are, not, are not a joke. And um, uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are an awful lot of good artists in Brooklyn. Um, but uh, There are a few. Yeah. Um, so it's but, the but death it's, of scenes it's a, it's a, it's you're talking a, about. It's a, you know, but New York will remain at the center, uh, along with, uh, to some extent, London, and a little extent Los Angeles, but, but really New York and London, uh, because we're still talking, besides conceptual art and digital art and video, we're still talking about a, a craft of handmade uh, unique objects, which can only be in one room mm -hmm. at a time anywhere. And, um, so they need to be concentrated. They need to be concentrated. And... Um, it's, uh, it's, it's archaic. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's very interesting. It's like the last, it's the only art form, major art form in visual art that um, is not economically supported by the sale of tickets or copies. You think about it. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and it really economically, and, and that's the, the, the weird thing about the market now, is, is uh, it's always a market is that the economic consumer of an artwork is one person who buys it, and then maybe it ends up in a museum. Uh, but, uh, and then if it ends up in a museum, it may or may not be on display. You know, I don't know what, what vanishing percentage of the Museum of Modern Arts collection is actually on, on, on display. Boy, I hated it when they did that renovation. They put in that four-story uh, or five-story atrium, you know, mm -hmm. like, Oh boy, you know, another corporate atrium in midtown Manhattan, you know. <laughs> but I was saying all the galleries they could have put in there, you know, uh, to, to show the art. But anyway. Um, can, can we talk about money? Yeah. Is money ruining art? No. I mean, money is, money is ruining money. I don't know. It's, it's uh, uh, it, well, there's always, there's always a market. I mean, it, it been since. Uh, since the 17th century, I mean, be, mm -hmm. as art lost the patronage of, of clerics and, and aristocrats and, 
royal. Um, the Dutch showed us how to huh? how art could live without yeah, priests. Yeah, well, I mean Rembrandt. Rembrandt was the first, you know, really hot entrepreneur. You know, he played the market. You mm -hmm. know, and made a lot of money and went completely bankrupt, and you know, thereby setting the pattern. For, uh, okay, <laughs> but. Uh, um, no, I mean, there was a time in back like in the 70s, I think, I remember, in the early 80s when the market came back after having been flat after the big recession in the 70s. Uh, I was sort of excited. It, it was like, uh, because if the market isn't deciding, institutions are deciding, and curators are deciding, and academics are deciding, and they're really boring. Sorry. Uh, Thanks. And uh, not... Not all, and not always, but, uh, you know, watch yourself. Um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, I generally thought that the market was making better decisions uh, on the whole than, than any critics. Uh, awesome. and, but, but, you know, but that was when, that was when a lot of money was still a lot of money. I mean, it was, uh, it was a different economy, it was a different world. I mean, I, all right. Two or three, four times in my life, I've bought an artwork. You know, my wife and I have taken a deep breath and bought an artwork. Sometimes, you know, and we could <clears throat> barely afford anything, but, you know, pay for it on time. And I discovered a great truth, which is that writing a check is so much more sincere than writing a review. Okay? <laughs> because, because it hurts, okay? I must really mean this, okay? <laughs> I write a review, I get paid, but, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but, but then it just, I mean, since the 90s, it's, it's just gone berserk, you know? And, it's, and there these people who have so much money that it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm saying, it's not that art is overpriced, it's that money is worthless. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, they just drive up in truckloads of it. And, uh, and from people who have <coughs> really an infinite amount of wealth, they know how to get it. And, uh, and it's, uh, it has, uh, this, is, this is, it's interesting. I mean, since, the, before the 60s, you know, avant-garde art, or even, even old master art, or, you know, sophistication in art was a fairly minority kind of elite within society, you know, and uh, the 60s were about an explosion, you know, and it, I mean, the great pop art collectors were doctors and lawyers, okay, mm -hmm. you know, were like nouveau riche, middle class, by the way, I think the nouveau riche is always the most exciting, you know, uh, generation, but for Baudelaire, he has, his, his little text called To the Bourgeois, you know, look it up. It's, it's basically, he, with great ambivalence, he is welcoming to power the rising bourgeois, whom he despises. But he is saying, it, it's, your, it's your game. Over to you. Yes, over to you. And, uh, but, you know, as, uh, but as the sort of popular audience for art expanded, the, the, uh, its its market prestige rose so, so that it's it's like it's happening in the stratosphere this market and you know and I have to keep reminding myself all the time I don't care I don't care you know I mean spend you know a half a billion dollars on on a, a beat up you know probable Leonardo we're not exactly sure uh, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm saying nothing except the next generation of stealth bombers should cost that much. But uh, it's true, the next, the next stealth bomber is the first one is going to be a half a billion dollars. Uh, the, the old ones, they, they have a hundred million apiece, they're, they're cheap. Um, but, uh, well, what you wrote about Salvatore Mundi was my favorite piece on it. I thought yeah. you, you pretty much said everything there was to say about it, but you did have that wonderful line that you just sort of simply semi quoted uh, about how if you spend a half a billion dollars on a, on a small painting, that's yeah. essentially you bought an attribution that money is now meaningless. Yeah. And when I read well, that, I thought he's right, and I'm standing at the edge of a well, cliff. Well, it's also, it's also interesting, I mean, that it's Leonardo, who we have, I mean, what, 18, 19 paintings by him? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, he was, uh, he painted, but he wasn't a painter. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a genius, okay? And, but he was also, why is he so glamorous now? I think because 
uh, of the tech, the glamour of technology. He, he was a technician, and uh, and basically, uh, he's a, he's like a 14 year old boy. I mean, like he's he's he, there's something there's something of like the, the young geek about him. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, I mean, the Mona Lisa is an incredible feat, you know, and, and, but it's a trick. I mean, he's, he, he gave a different expression to the eyes than to the mouth, okay? So that you look at the eyes and it's like your sense of the expression, and you look at the mouth and your sense of the expression changes, and you keep trying to reconcile it and you can't, and you think, well, fucking genius, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, How do you do that? You know, and, and, you know, and you got to hand it to him. But, but it was basically beauty for Leonardo was a technical problem. Everything was a technical problem, and like like any you know uh, pre-adolescent boy, I mean he, you know he was into natural disasters, warfare, gimmickry. Corpses. You know it's it's like Silicon Valley. You know he would have that's where he would have gone. You know and uh, uh, you know the man was not a grown-up. Um, when I look at that, and I, I I've thought about this uh, a while. Did did Leonardo invent the Mona Lisa, or did Walter Pater invent her with that incredible? No, essay no, that he I think I think it's oh interesting. Yeah, Walter Pater did a very influential essay on it in the nineteenth century. No, it's it's uh, no the, the the Renaissance as a as a, as a moment of radical in invention and reinvention, you know, it, yeah, no, that's, that's just a good symbol of it, you know, it's like, nothing like that had ever been made before, you know, and, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it, but he's, uh, you know, I like other painters here's, better. Here's a curveball for you. Okay. Do you believe in postmodernism? Do I believe in postmodernism? You think it's a real thing? Uh, it's not a, it's, it's a word, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, beyond being a word, does it, is it a word that describes uh, well, a real thing? No, it's, 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 uh, well, it, it's, uh, I guess I like it because of how crazy it is. You know, it's like, what does modern mean? Modern means now, okay? Post means after, okay? <laughs> after now, which is when exactly, it's you know? Tw it's tomorrow. I mean, it, it's the sense of being kicked out of time, which is, I think, rather common, you know? It's, uh. But uh, no, it was uh, it was like an uh, academic period. You know, I mean, the, the sense, the, certainly, the sense of modern art as modernism as a march of styles, a mainstream. You know, completely uh, shattered. You know, at the end of the sixties, and and so, but uh, but you know, academics weren't ready to give that up. It was too much. There's too much power in you know in identifying with the course of history. So, so they, they they rigged up. It's basically like you take the pieces and you rig them up together, and then you've got it you've got it running again. It's kind of you know it's uh, it's dropping nuts and bolts and there's a lot of smoke, but it's still you know you can still go forward. It's it's really they put the post on in order to hang on to modernism. You know, that is really quite deep, actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> Because where I was going with that is that I think postmodernism is a style within modernism, but you've just pretty much yeah, said it in a much yeah. more pithy way than I could. Uh -huh. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this being a competition and all. Uh, here's another one. Now, years ago, you wrote something that, that had me kind of stare at the page and reread it over and over. You said that art museums are not a safe place for art lovers. I didn't say that, I don't think. It, 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 art museums are... Uh, You're the only uh, art, art critic museum, I read. I say, so. No, I said I think I said I hate museums. Uh, uh, you know, it's, can you elaborate? Yeah, well, it's like um, uh, I tell a story. There's uh, probably everyone here is too young to remember who Willie Sutton was. It was back in the in the forties. He was a bank robber in in, in America. Oh, this is an older here. Uh, he was, uh, he was a gentlemanly bank robber, always impeccably dressed, extremely clever. Uh, it was captured a couple of times and escaped. He was like, you know, really slick. And, uh, and finally he was nailed and, and the reporter asked him, Willie, why do you rob banks? And Willie said, that's where the money is. <laughs> okay. 
and you know, I go to art museums because that's where the art is. Yeah. You know? And and I mean, the thing is, the, again, the the people I identify with or that I feel myself one of are are really kind of uh, uh, ragamuffin, uh, scallywag, um, you know. Uh, esthetes, you know, and, and who have crazy personal investments in art, and and uh, you can't organize us, you can't make a program for us, you know, it's like herding cats, all right? So, you know, we're going to go into the museum, get what we want, and get back out. We'll go past the acoustic guides and <laughs> past the gift shop, and, uh, you know, and the museums really shouldn't be concerned with us. But, you know, Put the, put the art up and put good light on it, and we're happy. That's, that's enough. But there are too few of you who are happy with that. Uh, well, it's, it's, you know, there, there are, museums have come to function in all kinds of ways for all kinds of people, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, it, it's like they have uh, replaced, look at the congregation here, you know, it's like, uh, like going to church. Uh, and, you know, they have replaced religious institutions to some extent and, and, uh, and civic centers. I mean, they, they do all these things, which I don't care about. But I, as you know, my former partner was an artist and someone said, yeah. said that to him, uh, that, uh, that our art museums had replaced churches. And he said, on what planet... Uh, because it's certainly not true for the majority of people. We only get but a small, well, small percentage of the people who live in this region well, who course, come to this gallery course. regularly. Well, it, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a small sect. It's sort of like say maybe the Anabaptists or something. <laughs> you know, it's, like a, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not a universal religion. But but, it, but it's, for those people, but it's, it's a small religion that. The small religion that imagines itself to be a universal religion, and all kinds of confusion comes out of that. You know, Beautiful. where we think, we think that if we find beauty in something, that it's beautiful, okay? That it does not follow, mm -hmm. you know? Beauty, but beauty is, is not a quality, it's a phenomenon. It's something that happens, you know? And um, it's, uh, I mean, the aesthetic is a whole range of complete, of irrational experiences. That that uh, that may touch us very deeply and and probably raise an anxiety about our own sanity. Like you know, and, you know, the moment I I fell for that Piero della Francesca, you know, it's like uh, you know, I was I clinically insane at that moment. You know, it was like I was certainly sort of off the planet, right? But then I told people about it, and they went, "Yeah." I was like, "Oh, phew." You know, I'm going to keep talking to these people, right? Mm. And that, that's, that's what I'm doing, I think. That's, that, that's what we're all doing. That's the conversation. It, it's really uh, trying to validate or check out uh, our own experience, you know, our own private experience, and, um, which, which is definitely a function of religion. Uh, so I'm sensing an opportunity here to think about art in a different way, that it's essentially a safe place for us to get in touch with our... Well, it's a safe, but, it's, but it's also it's also a it's also an arena. It's also a competition I mean, mm -hmm. because because you're going to hit somebody who disagrees. Somebody who says you are crazy. That's crap. You know, mm -hmm. it's crap. I think no. I cried. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what about theory? Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you also are known for dismissing art theory to a certain. I can't well, remember an exact moment, but there are some artists who those the theory is their work plans. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and people you wouldn't think of. Mike Kelly was very attached to the notion of theory and art. Uh, yeah. Well, he was. He was also fantastically perverse. I mean, and True. Uh, and quite brilliant. I knew him. And uh, but. Uh, you think he was putting me on when he said that? No, I mean, he weaponized it. I don't know. It's, mm. it's, uh, but it's also he, uh, he would use anything. I mean, he, he uh, uh, you know, he ran for several years with the, the old Freudian idea of repressed memory of trauma, you know, which now I believe is completely debunked. I mean, you know, the, a, a traumatic memory is, is not one you can't remember. It's one you can't forget. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, you simply are you simply are ridden by it like a demon. You know? That's true. And, and uh, so that you know not, not for that. But but he made a lot of works out of that idea, 
you know, and it's, I mean, there are no bad ideas for artworks, you know, it's like, it's what works and what doesn't, you know, and, uh, uh, but the idea that, that it can be prescribed by, uh, by a theoretical construction is, um, it's nuts. I mean, this is, it's also, it's, all, all it's going to do is illustrate the theory. I mean, what a theory is, is basically uh, starting, starting uh, approaching something with an answer mm. and then working back <laughs> to what the question was, you know, and then in science, in the course of doing that, you thought, whoop, no, nope, that doesn't work. And you've got to, you know, got to go back and retool the theory. In art, nothing, there, it, it never encounters reality. One, you know, it's, it's like, because it's all completely subjective, so suddenly everything lines up like a row of dominoes, you know, and, uh, you know, and it's terribly entertaining, because particularly in Academy, because you're 19, 20, 21 years old, and suddenly you're handed something that gives you a sense of power. You have no power. You are nobody, okay? And, uh, but, you know, suddenly you've, you've uh, smarter than, you know. Uh, but you're, you're acting yeah, on yeah, planet yeah, moot, yeah, though, yeah. essentially, in well, art. About, it's planet it's about, moot. Also, it's about being right, which is, you know, the, uh, art, art, there is no right or wrong in art. There is right or wrong in the world. There's right or wrong, you know, it's, 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 it's good or bad. You know, and, and you can't, we, we want in our culture to square our aesthetic values with our political values and our moral values and, you know, keep trying. It doesn't work, you know. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't work. I, I don't want to monopolize, uh, monopoli monopolize oh, okay. uh, the... the, the, um, the great honor of being the person who gets to ask all the questions. I know you like... Q and A's. Yeah, sure. And I am imagining there's probably a couple of people I in there to... who can think of a question that I didn't ask. Mm -hmm. Is it time? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Are there takers? Okay. Uh, there's a microphone there, and I highly recommend you use it unless no, you're uh, either, a professional actor. Either that, actor. or just, uh, or just uh, shout it out, and I'll repeat it. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the dichotomy with art criticism with time. Um, so, for example, in 82, when Basquiat collaborated with Warhol, it was panned very widely. And Still here is. we are, 35, not necessarily, 35 years later, a lot of people are yeah. holding them very beloved pieces. And why yeah. that dichotomy? Well, it's not a dichotomy. It's a, it's a matter of adjustment. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, anything new, anything really new and different, is going to offend us. And, you know, I think it is people who immediately embrace the new, I, I don't believe them, I think they're lying. It's like, uh, I think it is, it is a biological defense organism to preserve our sense of reality mm -hmm. under attack. And the new theme feels like an attack. And, um, you know, and, and I mean, there are people who say, you know, I, went, I saw that, I hated it. And I said, well, and, and what do you say? And I said, well, listen, Go back, look at it again. You know, it's like, maybe you hate it more. You know, but it's like, uh, you know, give it another take. Because that's what happens. It's, it's like, maybe it's not so threatening. Maybe it's kind of interesting. This is, we're all held together with, like, you know, scotch tape and, and uh, bandages, you know. And uh, we have our shaky structures. And, uh, you know, but if we're if we're we are adaptable, we will make room for the new thing and put it back together and be whole again. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I mean, the, the, it's interesting the Warhol Basquiat thing. I mean, that was uh, it was such. I, I wasn't crazy about those those collaborations, and I'm still not. I mean, I think they're okay, but uh, it was largely actually it was a, it was a very uh, generous thing of Warhol to do because at that time Basquiat was really falling apart, you know, and he was uh, uh, on drugs and he had, he had really passed his peak and, and Warhol kind of took him in. But of course he was very glamorous and it was a glamorous thing. Anyway, it was anyone who had any resentment of hype and fashion or gloss, I mean, it's, it was an automatic target. Everyone shot at it, you know, uh, and, uh, but... Uh, those collaborations were also dealer's ideas, I recall. I uh, wrote, yeah, I wrote about Bruno this. Bruno Bischofberger, yeah, the, uh, the German. Uh, and, uh, 
Uh, Julian Schnabel uh, made a movie about Basquiat. It was actually pretty good. It's a, I think it was... Uh, kind Unless of, you who, played, who played Bruno <laughs> Bischofberger? It was... Uh, uh, it was uh, Easy Rider. What was his name? What? Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper, Hopper. yeah. Yeah, and he says... Uh, I remember his great line in the movie was, I have to have that painting. <laughs> thought, Thank yeah. you. Um, Don't do accents, Dennis. <laughs> Can we get another question? Yeah. I can't let you go without asking you to have five minutes on your fellow Minnesotan, Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan? Uh, Artist and Yeah. Yeah, he's a terrible painter. And, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but, you know, he's better than I am. But, by the way, I, I, I have painted, and I've painted, I, I like to say I've painted just enough to have odd respect for mediocre painters. It's like, <laughs> it is. It is really hard, okay? I mean, just being, just being mediocre is, is an achievement. Uh, but uh, Bob Dylan, actually, there's a great story. Is that Bob Dylan was probably killed poetry as an art form. Uh, uh, Said for, the poet. Yeah, no, it's, it, yeah, no, but it was, I mean, poetry was a big deal in the early 60s. And you know, it was mm -hmm. like when I came into it, and I was ambitious, and, and there were all kinds of openings, and there was a lot of sort of glamour about it. Uh, anybody know where Taylor Mead was? Taylor Mead was a uh, mm -hmm. boho guy downtown, uh, you know, uh, boho, crazy, weird guy, but, but sort of brilliant, you know? Uh, and he was taken to a Finnish village coffee house in 61 or 62, and there was a scraggly-haired kid from Minnesota playing a guitar. And at the break, he turned to the people at the table and said, the poets have had it. And so it was. <laughs> now, from that moment, any kid who has the chops to be a good poet is in the garage with a guitar. I mean, you know, pop music since the 60s, I mean, pop, you know, lyric have been fantastic. I mean, it's just a golden age. And that's, uh, you know, what... And then there are a few people still making jagged lines on a piece of paper. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it doesn't, it's not going yeah. to play. I stopped reading Baudelaire when I discovered David Bowie. <laughs> so there's something to that. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. <laughs> Another question. Okay, yeah. Canadian art. Well, uh, that's a very dangerous question. You should yeah. ask, ask the Australians what happened when he was asked that question. But anyway, oh, yeah. here no, we go. I, I, made, I made enemies in Australia. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, uh, Stan Douglas, I mean, I don't know, there are a number of... You're the guy who called him the closest thing to a genius in the Whitney Biennial, in the Village Voice. Now I remember, it was you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Stan Douglas. Yeah, I did that. Sorry. Um, no, but, uh, and... Uh, and who were we looking at today? We were looking at uh, your, your newly beloved Lauren Harris. Mm -hmm. but by the way, I, I really love the collection here. I mean, it was, it was really a revelation to me. Good. Yeah. You know, I was, I mean, I, I had seen works of his before, and I saw them in Toronto, and somehow mm -hmm. it didn't really click. But, uh, oh. Name drop. My good friend Steve Martin, who is a good friend, uh, you know, is a big enthusiast for Canadian painting. And anytime I go to his house, there's usually a new painting that I don't know who it's by, and it's by a Canadian. And mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. that's great. And I think that we even got you to smile at a Bordeaux, although you don't smile at Riopelle, but that may be personal. Uh, yeah. No, I don't know. It's. Then please don't lead me into this. Okay, slaughter. sorry. No, no. That was really bad. Uh, oh, now we got a lineup. Let's let's leave Sleeping Dogs line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks a lot for this uh, talk. It's really interesting. I, I'm intrigued by that uh, sentence you you stated that uh, art is a process, and you also said else uh, in other context that it's quite subjective. So how do you do that as an individual who engages with art? experiences an emotion, a personal process, and then you write for the whole world. So why, why, how, how does this actually work to be so subjective and still having the 
Okay. The so, gumption so to write for the whole world. Well, I think that it's I think question. that's you know, you would you ask that question of Dostoevsky or Tolstoy? I mean, it's like Dostoevsky, actually, good good example. You know, you don't get more deeply subjective than him, and he thrills everybody. Now, it's it's about it's about uh, what's universal is that we all have inner lives, in which we are generally lonely and confused and unconnected, and uh, good writing, good art, you know, make it, uh, make it viable for a minute. You know, it's not, it's nothing saves us in the long run, but... Uh, I, actually, I like, I like to think, but also it's, it's really kind of uh, becoming symbiotic with the writer or the artist. I mean, uh, like a vaca it's a vacation for myself. You know, I get tired of being myself. I, you know, I look... I look at a Rembrandt, I look at a Rembrandt portrait, I get Rembrandt and the subject, you know, it's a two in one, you know, and, uh, and it's like putting on a virtual reality helmet and suddenly I'm thinking with another brain, feeling with another heart, you know, and it's, it's uh, and I return to myself a little dazed and, and um, you know, and I, then I want to do it again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, over here. Mm -hmm. Based on what you're seeing out there today in terms of what is good and sort of the good, bad, and the ugly, um, and the ugly that you go, keep going back for, what would be your advice for aspiring artists today? Uh, uh, get to work. Uh, <laughs> advice for aspiring artists? I mean, it's... Uh, I mean... Uh, I don't know. Accept your fate, you know? Uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy being an artist. And, um, uh, you know, and realize that, um, well, first of, all, first of all, you may not be an artist. You may discover you're not really an artist, which, you know, is great good fortune. And then you can have a regular life and, you know, and be happy. Early uh, enough. Huh? Or discover that early enough is yeah. a great good fortune, yes. Uh, you know, and... Uh, I don't know. I don't. Can you make the question a little more specific? Or? Sure. Um, so, I think that I'm asking because I'm not an aspiring artist. But you're I'm not an aspiring. I'm partnered to one, and I would like to know oh. how to help him. Oh, oh dear. Oh how dear. can you determine whether your partner is an artist? <laughs> okay. Ah. Well, they better they better have other qualities. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, um, because, I mean, an artist is, first of all, I think Baudelaire defined it, like most things, perfectly. He said an artist is a child who has acquired adult discipline. You know, that is, but all the rest of him is still child, okay? But he's got the discipline of an, of an adult. And, and, uh, oh, I see. And, uh, you know, and how that works out over the dinner table, that is something else, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it, I mean, artists, artists are people who have a, first of all, they're unhappy. <laughs> all artists are unhappy people. <laughs> it, it's like, it just stands to reason. I mean, you know, we all come into the world which is full of things from coffee cups to galaxies, okay? And, and it, you know, there's more than enough for several lifetimes in the world, you know, if we're happy. An artist comes into the world and says, this is all very well, now it needs this, okay? <laughs> okay, now it's okay. Until the next morning, and then it's not okay again, okay? So it's, it's like, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, I think there's a, I think artists are people who spend their entire lives trying to take happiness by ambush and, and, <laughs> and failing every single time. And, you know, I mean, Beckett said, you know, fail again, fail better, you know. Um, and uh, that's what we do. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll make this the last one. I yeah, think that's convenient. Uh, my question is... Um, uh, what kind of advice you can give to the artist to be uh, recognized while he or she is still alive? Um, that, that'd be recognized? And, uh, yeah. Okay, and the thing first is, of all, be very, very good 
Yeah, uh, okay. I haven't fin finished my question yet. Uh, if you think about Van Gogh, if huh? he Van Gogh, yeah, if he lives in uh, nowadays, I don't think he will be ever recognized because he never had his painting sold. He never had exhibition. Listen, he he had he had, had he had had like three years of good work. He he was uh, if he had stuck around another five years, he would have had a villa. No, okay? and also because you know, of I mean, his brother, been, his brother is an art star. dealer, so what? he has a lot of advantages and huh? a lot of artists here who have no access to this kind of uh, exposure and the connections. And especially if you li live in Ottawa, it's not really ideal place for artists. So, what kind of advice you would have? For the artists. Well, you find out it's 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 like you know I think it's it's like it's like you're a rat. You learn the sewer system. I don't know. It's, you know, <laughs> it's like it's like you you go if you don't if you lack information, you go to where it is. Okay, and and you find out your own temperament. You know, some 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 people are extroverted and good manipulators, and will make you know will find a way and you know to to fame other other people. I mean, fame is 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 a, is a. I mean, it's a very toxic substance, you know, which only some substances, only some organisms can handle. You know, uh, it absolutely destroys others. And uh, uh, by the way, I thought one thing I tell kids when I've, the time I've, I've talked in schools and so on is that when you come to the city or wherever you go, you're going to go to some kind of center, you're going to some place where where there, is, there are peers that you can, you know, have a gang or uh, in contact, you will be a nobody, okay? And being a nobody, I know, is uh, painful. But the day, your days of being a nobody are the most important days of your life in mm. terms of your career. I was, you know, I was a poet, dropout, you know, uh, uh, in the 60s and uh, at a time when journalism was very much... Uh, uh, disdained in the art world, and uh, but I was sort of Peter the poet. Anyway, I was on the down. I knew the artists. I hung out with the artists. I drank with the artists. I slept with the artists. And uh, you know, but I was just Peter. You know, I was like, because uh, you know, in any sophisticated situation, when you're a nobody, no one will bother to lie to you. <laughs> you will get the straight dope from everybody because you don't matter. The moment you're somebody, you've heard your last truth. It's like, you know, <laughs> you know it, it, to everybody, everybody with any brains will try to spin you as they should because they, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a rat fuck, you know? It's a, sorry, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and on that note. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank I'm you. So, so much, Peter, for your generosity uh, uh, tonight with us. Uh, that's maybe the best interview I've heard with you. Oh. Right, thank you. <laughs> you were very great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.